Barack Obama, Francois Hollande, Hu Jintao, Nicolas Sarkozy, Jacques Chirac are some of the best known leaders my guest today dines with, chats with, and meets with in global corridors of power like the yearly Davos Economic Forum in Switzerland. With them, Pascal Lamine is a friend, party comrade, an advisor, a partner, or something else. At 67 today, Frenchman Pascal Lamine has had time to rub shoulders with those who matter in contemporary society, either as a political advisor or as an economist and businessman. A product of the French Institute of Political Studies, Paris School of High Commercial Studies, and the National School of Administration at Strasbourg, Pascal Lamy specialized in economics and served as French Minister of Finance in the government of Prime Minister Pierre Mouroua with Francois Mitterrand as president. After working for years in the French civil service, he moved to the European Union Commission, first as an advisor to Commission President Jacques Delors, and second as the personal assistant to this man, the father of Martin Aubry, the former first secretary of the French Socialist Party. The Iron Man character he established at the European Union Commission meant the departure of President Jacques Delors in 1994 also meant his departure and moved to what he knows best, business, and landed in one of France's most important banks, Crédit Lyonnais, as Director General. This after he held some junior staff post. One legacy he left at Crédit Lyonnais was a restructuring of the bank, ending with their privatization in the year before 2000. Mission accomplished, Pascal Lamine was called back to the European Union Commission to become the European Union Commissioner for Trade with former Italian Prime Minister Romano Prodi as Commission President. A member of the French Socialist Party since 1969, the year the fame of France's most respected figure Charles de Gaulle came to an end, Pascal Lamy, Geneviève Lamy's husband, has held key positions within the party, including that of being member of the political bureau of the Socialist Party. After years spent in Brussels, the European Union capital, to foster trade amongst the European Union countries, the French government of Prime Minister Jean-Pierre Raffarin with Jacques Chirac as president, campaigned for his candidature of the Director General of the World Trade Organization. Between 2005 and 2013, he served as the boss of the Global Trade Agency, which counts 153 members today, including Russia, who became a member under his Director Generalship. Extremely difficult to decode, Sources lament President François Hollande called him to be prime minister in the place of Manuel Valls, but he rejected. With a combined experience in the public and private sectors, the former director general of the World Trade Organization is today running for the presidency of the International Anti-Corruption Non-Governmental Organization Watchdog, Transparency International. Is Pascal Lamy the best choice to deal with corruption? globally. Pascal Lamine, welcome to Globe Watch. Thank you very much. The African Progress Report states that about 50 billion leave Africa yearly because of illicit financial flows. That is according to the Kofi Atta Annan report, if you can call it that way. When you were Director General of the World Trade Organization, what reforms did you introduce to ensure there is transparency in the flow of capital across the world? Well, the World Trade Organization is about trade. It's not about finance. Finance is run, as you may know, by the International Monetary Fund, by the World Bank, other international organizations. But true, and I've been thinking this for a long time, 
I was one of the founders of Transparency International, which is the big worldwide NGO that fights against corruption. I was one of the founders of this in France. So I've been after corruption for a long time in my life. And in the World Trade Organization, the connection with corruption is mostly in the area of public procurement. The rules of the World Trade Organization state that if you open your public procurement system, notably to foreign operators, then there are a number of rules that you have to follow in order to provide for the necessary transparency, due process. At the end of the day, as elsewhere, transparency is the best medication against corruption. Sure. Transparency is the best medication of keeping the global economy in good health. You were the Director General of the World Trade Organization. When you were managing the affairs of that important international agency, did you sense any elements of the fact that our world lacks transparency to a particular extent what's responsible for the global economic tumor? I think you have a point. When you look, for instance, at what happened in the financial system that led to this big await crisis, part of the problem was in transactions or financial products, the characteristics of which were not transparent. So, and when you look at what each country is trying to do since to stabilize, regulate properly the financial system, a lot of that has to do with transparency, with the disclosure of trusts, with tax havens, uh, with tracking illicit financial flows, whether, by the way, they come from corruption, crime, or, let's say, tax uh, excessive harmonization. You and I are just coming from a conference where the debate was on how banks can be sanctioned of these illicit financial flows like the US regulators are doing for the moment. You know about the guy in New York who has no pity on all European banks, be it PNB Paribas, be it Credit Lyonnais. Uh, do you think that African governments should be given the opportunity to sanction European banks that are taking this liquidity out of the continent? Well, the US regulator is sanctioning banks which operate in the US, starting with US banks. Now, true, some European banks, which had been operating in US, Even companies, have been you have British Petroleum, BP, who have been sanctioned by US uh, regulators. Absolutely, because they have operations in the US. Accepted. And the US regulation applies to countries who have operations in the US. So, by the way, the Europeans are doing the same. If you look at what the UK Financial Authority, for instance, did in the case of this Libor scandal, a number of British banks have been heavily sanctioned. So, in my view, this goes in the same direction. It goes in the right direction. I think the truth is that most of the banks who've been caught with, let's say, covering illicit finance were Western banks so far. But there are other banks coming into the market, including Asian so banks. So what kind of mechanism should African countries establish to ensure that this finance remains on the continent? Since they cannot sanction or control European banks, uh, British banks, American banks, Swiss banks, because this money in reality is found there. What kind of mechanism should or financial cooperation should exist between the West and Africa in this sector? First, African governments can sanction banks who are operating in Africa, including a large stake of Western Bank. But you understand Whether the politics involved in this. Do you think that a country like Gabon, a country like Sierra Leone, a country like my country, Cameroon, can sanction a French bank? Of course, they Without can. Without any political fallout. Of course, they can do that, <coughs> provided they have the proper legislation and the proper enforcement legislation. Which leads me to my second point, which is that in order for this to happen, you need a higher level of international cooperation. For instance, what the G20 
is doing in fighting against corruption, money laundering, uh, and not, again, not only for corruption, but also for terrorism or for drug trafficking, goes, in my view, in the right direction. If African countries feel too weak to sanction these operators, the best thing that can be done for them is to provide them with international benchmarks, which are agreed at international level, and which then they have no choice but to implement. One key element of European banks in particular, and I touch the Swiss here, is secrecy. You have banks with secrecy laws, and this money is found there. How can you negotiate? Good point, <coughs> which is why banking secrecy has considerably receded in this planet, notably since the 08 crisis. I mean, Swiss banks, for instance, have now been obliged to renounce to banking secrecy, which was one of their comparative advantages. Now, the problem being, of course, that that's fine if there's no banking secrecy anywhere left on this planet. We know we are not yet there. But again, the solution here is more international cooperation, more global disciplines, which each and every country is obliged to enforce at home. You know of the turmoil in the European economic space today. Um, the French economy is not in its best shape. Uh, the European Central Bank is reducing the interest rates on a daily basis. Um, what can be done to save the European economy? You know the crisis of the euro franc currency. The European economy uh, is exiting the crisis, but at a very slow pace of growth. You, you, what, what authorizes you to say that when you know that the French have reshuffled their government because the economy grew at zero percent? You know that I'm, even I'm the German economy is not in the best shape today, the British the same. You, Spain, most European countries are under a, 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 a rescue plan. That was true yesterday. <laughs> it's not true today anymore. What remains true is that the relative growth of Europe is lower than US <coughs> and US is lower than emerging countries. And this is probably going to be the case. What is the, the best therapy for the moment for the European no. economies? There are things which explain this slow growth which can only be addressed very long term. Like for instance demography. The European population is shrinking which is not a good sign of economic dynamism. On the other hand, they have to keep rebalancing their books. Huh? You know, most European countries were heavily over-indebted, both in public and private finance. So they have to de finish the deleveraging. It's going on, but it takes time. And then they have to do structural reform. There are areas like labor market, like pensions, where the economic social system in Europe, which is a very good one, which is seen by many countries as the best on the planet, still has to adjust in order to survive. You know what is happening in Ukraine today? It is during your director generalship, if um, statistics don't bear, bear me out, that Russia was admitted into the World Trade Organization. Do you think uh, the coming of Russia to the World Trade Organization was a case or a blessing? Ukraine joined the World Trade Organization before Russia did. And if Russia did at the time, it's because Russia thought that it would be good for Russia. Now, no, to the global economy, do you think the coming of Russia to the World Trade Organization was a case of a blessing? I think like every country joining a global trade rule-based system, any country joining is good for the system. And by the way, which is why 90% of world trade today is within the WTO standard. So definitively, it was good news for Russia and good news for world trade. Now, whether Russia properly implements its obligations, like China, like US, like any African countries, that's for the day-to-day -day management of the world trade. You are running for the presidency of Transparency International. What will you bring? Why should you be voted? 
I think, uh, well, first, because it's a cause on which I have dedicated quite a part of my public engagement for a long time. Sure. Second, I'm now free. I don't have any... Oh, when you are the World Trade Organization, you were not free. No, I wasn't free. No, Why? no, wh when you are the head <laughs> of a public institution, sure. you are not free. The pressure you from left to right. You have to serve the mandate which the members of this organization okay. have given you when they have elected you, mm. like any public position. Mm. So I'm now free. I can choose the causes on which I want to work, mm -hmm. on which I, I want to spend my political capital, and I choose corruption as the number one because I think it's a major global issue and I think I have in the management of global issue some experience which could help our colleagues and all the activists, militants. Uh, the Transparency National is not just an expert organization. It's, it's, a, it's an NGO. What we're trying to engage is civil society, people, in order to put the necessary pressure on government so that we can end corruption, not just limit corruption. Okay. You are found in Africa. You are going for the presidency of Transparency International. Most African governments have been accused of being corrupt. There is one fundamental element affecting African communities today, terrorism. One report indicates that people who are in the Nigerian Central Bank help to finance Boko Haram and other terrorist groups through the central banks of most African governments. When you would be the president of Transparency International, what will you do to get the flow of financial resources to financial terrorism? I will keep doing what my predecessors did, if I am elected. Huguette Labelle, Akere Mouna, who for a long time was the African vice president of Transparency International. I'm running with a Zambian Vice President, Ruben Lifuka, and I think the policy here is very clear. More transparency, more accountability, more pressure so that if a bank is handling dirty money, knowing that it is dirty money, it is taken to court as a complicit of money laundering. And then the second element is that banks have to do the necessary verifications, the sort of know your customer procedures, so that they can certify the provenance and the destination of the monies they handle. You have so much experience in the global management of business, trade, organization, commerce. If you were to produce a shock statement, a therapy to the global economic health, what will you do? I would try and promote more international cooperation and not less. Uh, globalization is more and more interconnecting our economic systems, our societies. What's lacking so far is the proper level of go global governance able to harness this globalization to the benefits of the people. So what we need to do is to re-embed Economic globalization, which has lifted hundreds of millions of but people you know out we of are living in an and e e political You know systems. we are living in an equal world. Do you think that at one moment in life, the global trade, global balance of a trade will not be imbalanced? Yeah, and I mean, the answer is obviously yes. And if you look at the structure of international trade today as compared to 20 years ago, it is much more balanced. When there are no reforms to make equitability or to make equal rights at the IMF, the World Bank, where all those institutions are not reformed. What gives you the courage to say that one day the I global economy will be an equal one, that Cameroon will have the same position with the US, with France and other countries, well, the UK? First, that, that depends a lot on Cameroon itself <laughs> and a bit on international cooperation. Sure. But if I look at what's happened for the last 20 years, and try and think of what the world will be like 20 years from now, developing countries which ha will have a much higher weight in the world economy, hence a much higher political weight, and that's, thing, that's what I wish. Final thought. Personally, do you think you will be elected <laughs> president of Transparency International? That's a question which nobody standing for an election will 
answer a priori. We have a campaign. There are different candidates. We try and move our own ideas. We do that with the hope of being elected, like any electoral process. You are not, you are not sure of your answer. Of course not. Of course not. Who would go to an election thinking, I'm sure I'm going to be elected? I wouldn't like to be this politician. The former Director General of the World Trade Organization, who is now running for the presidency of Transparency International, one of the most powerful non-governmental organizations in the world. Pascal Lamy, thanks very much for accepting to be guest no. on our program. Thanks for the show. The director of the leading uh, pool tracker in, 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 in Russia, Levada Center, Levi Gutkov, says, quote, the aggressive and deceptive propaganda of the new Russian administration is worse than anything I witnessed in the Soviet Union. Do you think that uh, Mr. Putin is worse than Stalin? I don't know. I don't know. But what I know is that what uh, explains the behavior of a leader is the context in which he's living. You know, most European authorities, including the British monarchy, have been quoted of saying that Mr. Putin is like um, Adolf Hitler, uh, even uh, former US Secretary of State. That is a tradition in Europe. When even they have a problem Secretary, with somebody, Even former US Secretary of State, um, 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 Hillary Clinton has made similar allegations as like in the situation of what is happening today. To what it's, it's that, that is a strategy of mobilization of the memory. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Anytime you will find that, try to see what happened with Libya. Mm. When they wanted to attack Libya, Li, uh, the Gaddafi become Idle. When they wanted to attack Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein become Idle. That there is a traditional way of behavior of European or Western superpower when they want to go uh, to war with uh, another person. Uh, maybe let us conclude this interview with comments from British Prime Minister uh, David Cameron, who has likened the words dilemma with Putin to relations between the then British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain with Adolf Hitler in Munich in 1938. You know that the last uh, agreement which led to the Second World War was in 1938 and when um, the policy of appeasement, uh, the then British Prime Minister, uh, after signing an agreement with Mr. Um, uh, Hitler, said, quote, um, I believe it is peace of our time and that did not prove to be peace of our time. This is what um, David Cameron has said, we run the risk of repeating the mistakes made in Munich in 1938. We cannot know what will happen next. Um, is it appeasement, negotiation, or striking? Which policy is best to deal with uh, Putin's agenda today? I think it's better to negotiate. If you are here in Cameroon and somebody bring his military in your frontier, I don't know how you are will represent yourself as a leader. Try to make a relationship between uh, with what happened in the north part of our country, where the president declared that we are in war. Because transborder criminality come from Nigeria over Cameroon, go back to Nigeria and so on. Then I think I'm not a politician when I'm speaking. I'm speaking as a university person. What is important is to know that uh, there is a lot of country in the world, and that one side cannot take all. It is the same problem that we are dealing with Western when we are dealing with Africa. They must accept that they have to share influence. You cannot take all, even in the room of the, another country. I think that there has also to recognize that Russia has the right to have an area of influence. I don't know where they are representing themselves, what they are representing themselves, if they know that European Union will come up to Ukraine, who is in the border of Russia, and then NATO will come to, you know, in politics, that is military too much politics. Right? Yeah, that is a provocation. Okay. And I think they want it to provoke, and I think, you, uh, Russia. Okay. And you know that at the beginning. What leads us to the actual situation is what the fact that a pro-Russian president has been elected and they refuse to accept it, they make pressure. Do you call the change of power earlier in the course of year in Ukraine a coup? I think. You think? Yeah. Final thoughts. Um, when you go to the fourth floor 
of the Moscow University of the Sociology Department, there is a door written there, um, Center for Conservative Research. Is Russian conservative a threat to the world? <laughs> no, everybody is uh, conservative in some aspect and uh, also progressive in some other aspect.